Okay, so at the beginning of this talk, I would like to have, like uh, Dominique Stutzman this morning, I would like to have a, a look back because I think it's important to explain why I proposed last year to Isabel to do this conference. Um, in fact, I arrived myself to digital humanities thanks to the papyri. Without the papyri, I maybe <laughs> won't have joined this world, I don't know. So uh, the opportunity to pass from a traditional paperwork, scholarly work, to the digital humanities was done for me in 2009, where we had a conference in Lausanne about papyri, uh, co-organized with Jean Zumstein, and published in 2011. The book before, my PhD, I used just three times the word computer. And then 2009, wow, I opened the eyes on this new world. And you have in the bibliography uh, scholars of my field who were already involved uh, in this world. I mean, article by David Parker and Ulrich Schmidt. You have all the references in the handouts. So we organized um, this lecture in 2011, and then it was the start in Lausanne of a big movement about digital humanities. And finally, in 2011, we organized the first conference in Switzerland where the expression digital humanities was used for the first time. It was the adventure and the story. And today, I have just a very simple uh, purpose in my talk with two test cases, um, P45 and 0171, I would like simply to remind or to demonstrate that to see digitally at manuscripts is changing everything. We were doing that before. <laughs> Maybe it sounds for young scholars like another world, the world of dinosaurs or something like that, but we, we went in libraries I went in 2004 to Münster, and I was so happy to look at to the, my profile there. And we, we were in front of such machine, uh, looking patiently to my profiles. It's just 15 years later. It's not so much. And it's an entire new world, because we look at the manuscripts. And I take two examples to demonstrate it. So the first one is 0171. Maybe some of us are already thinking, it's not a papyrus. It's true, it's not a papyrus. But it's a complicated case. Let's see it uh, closer. This fragment was found in Hermopolis Magna and shows some verses from the Gospel of Luke. Uh, that is a story written around 1718 of our era. This uh, teeny manuscript is kept in the Biblioteca Messina Lorenziana in Florence and contains notably Luke 22, 44, 50. A few verses from the Gospel of Matthew are also from the same manuscript in the Berlin Papyrus 11,863, which belongs also in our New Testament vocabulary to 0171. This manuscript in Florence had two numbers because it was published in two steps in 1912 PS112 and 1913 PS224. The point is that the tiny fragment at the bottom of it was first not included in the publication and it had a lot of consequences. Indeed, uh, you have hit three paintings of quite famous uh, scene in the heart history and also in the reception history. For example, when you say, I sweat like drops of blood, you think to this passage, I mean two verses of the Gospel of Luke, uh, present only more or less in the half of the manuscripts and not in the other half. Um, and the case of our O171 is absolutely crucial, in my opinion, to uh, decide of the case. In 2012, um, Pasquale Orsini, and we have our deep thoughts to him and um, his wife quite now, and to Willy Clarisse, they have uh, brought strong support to Yaros, who was apparently the first to propose to date this manuscript around 200 uh, of our era and not around 300. 
Currently, we can see both dates running on websites, articles, and we are still in transition. But today, I would like to strongly support the point of view of um, Clarisse and Orsini in this talk. As I said, we can uh, see the other fragments in uh, the database of papyri. But in fact, it's not a papyri, <laughs> it's a pergament. But uh, Isabel told me we have about 20% of wrong material <laughs> in the papyri database, more or less. <laughs> Um, but to see it, make it clear. So we can see this manuscript, for example, in the Münster database. So now I try to go um, to go out of my screen to sh see, show it to you directly online to respect all the copyrights as we are supposed to do. So you see it here. That's the first part of the fragments published in 1912. Guy Anas does, you see the start of the verse here, and here you have the second fragment published later. And without doubt, we can see some uh, letters, some words of Luke 22, 44. Here you have just P10 again, that's the drops falling down to the soil, to, to the ground. So, without doubts, we have here this famous passage uh, of the sweat like drops of blood. So, you have seen, so you have seen, you, sh you should believe it now, <laughs> according to the ancient uh, uh, belief of seeing, is uh, to have confidence in something. But if we come back to uh, the situation today, in presentation mode, you can see with me that on the website PSC Online in Florence, you have still the indication that it would start at Luke 22, 45 and not 44. So probably we need to see more, more and more this manuscript to be convinced as scholars that one, it's not a papyrus. And Logically, it should not belong to the papyri databases. Secondly, yes, it has some words of the verse Luke 22, 44. And this data should be corrected everywhere. It has a lot of importance and influence for the case uh, of the variant of Luke, because if Orsini and Clarice are right with the date of around 200 rather than 300, and as you have seen with me, with your eyes, that we have some words of Luke 22, 44, it means that we have a manuscript at least contemporaneous of Papyrus 75 with uh, this fragment. And if we follow Brent Nangbri and the later date for Papyrus 75, it's still more convincing that our most ancient witnesses would be 0171 for the sweat like drop of blood. So that's a very important case. And um, let's see how research will uh, go with that in further steps. Um, I given I given to you in the handout my forthcoming article in La Revue des Etudes Juives in the next issues, and I try to to make this point clear in this article. The second test case of the importance to see manuscripts is the famous Papyrus Forty Five. It is at the Chester Betty Library. You have an image here. And first, when it was discovered, it was really honored as the most ancient manuscript of the New Testament. But progressively, since uh, the discoveries of P75 in the 50s, it has lost uh, its higher strength to become more or less something like a secondary or even third category text regarding the importance of Papyrus 55. But it's important, as uh, Laurent did just before, it's really important to not forget the state of the history. And you can see uh, in this quotation by Fitzmaier in 62, that at the moment where scholars were studying together, 45 and 75, they were really considering both together. 
He tells, it's surprising to note that papyrus 75 is often at odds with papyrus 45, the Chester BT papyrus, which contains part of Luke and it's roughly half a century older. The fact that papyrus 45 and papyrus 75 come from Egypt and date from a time before the completion of the Great Ancients, and that they nevertheless do not agree as to their readings, gives evidence of a fluctuating state of the text in that country at an early period. It is what Fitzmaier told in 62. In my opinion, we have just taken more or less 50 years to slowly finally come back more or less to the same evaluation. Let's see that. So. A very important turning point for papyrus 35 has been taken around the years 2000. First with this book of Kim Ines Eitzen, uh, where she really pointed to the fact that the classification and the aesthetics of hands were largely uh, related to the opinion or the impression of individual scholars. And with the famous um, conference happened at the Chester Library, in 2000 and published in 2004. And uh, as you know, Larry Hurtado has supported um, with all his authority and cleverness, the importance of Papyrus 45. From that moment, uh, we had a new consideration for Papyrus 45. And in a certain sense, I would say, we have more or less lost 40 years between this, these two moments. Now the situation is that we can uh, admire these two old witnesses online. Papyrus 75 is now called Papyrus Anna 1 and uh, has been given uh, to the Vatican Library and Papyrus 45 is at the Chester Betty Library. It's really interesting because now we can see this manuscript as much as we wish, but we don't see in recent years scholars fighting for another against the other. No scholars is now doing big arguments to absolutely defend uh, the beautiful writing of Papyrus 75 against this one of Papyrus 45, for example. I'm quite convinced that the, that the simple fact that we can see these two manuscripts together help us maybe to slow down the surevaluation of aesthetics in writings and consider what we have at the end. Tiny fragments uh, escaped by chance from the forgetting uh, of the past, something like that. In the most recent years, we can see as though the importance of seeing a papyrus. In these two articles by Cole and Roth, we have very fine description of teeny details uh, of Papyrus 45. Uh, Jeremy Cole is observing, Zakaria Cole is observing what happens at the borders of the folios, whereas Roth is examining in details all the different overbars um, above nomina sacra and so on. I'm quite convinced as well that these two articles would have not been written before the digital era, at least not in such an extent. They are fruits of the fact that we can see as much as we wish this manuscript online. A final word, um, I dedicate this brief talk to Emmanuel Leroy Ladurie, who just passed away. Uh, who was very important for the digital humanities, because as you know, probably uh, it's well known, he told, l'historien de demain sera programmeur ou ne sera pas. Uh, tomorrow's historian will be programmer or, or won't be. And in my opinion, uh, we arrive now at the next step because we are more or less more emerged in the digital culture, maybe not all programmers, even if we have to do it more and more every day. Um, but the digital culture has led us to the next step in New Testament textual criticism. We cannot work alone anymore, and we cannot work in one language anymore. 
we have really to become multidisciplinary team, and that's the spirit uh, of this conference, and to work in, with different linguistic competencies that is absolutely crucial to go further in NTTC. So I would like to reformulate this sentence, and um, I think that tomorrow's NTTC scholars will work in multidisciplinary teams or won't. Thank you for your attention.